the Second World War, Kiev became one of the most important strategic points for the belligerent enemy. During the German offensive in the summer of 1941, it hindered their advancement both to Moscow and to the southeast of Ukraine to coal deposits in the Donbass, as well as to ports on the Black Sea coast. Stalin, guided by the military doctrine of an offensive war, did not agree to the retreat of Soviet troops, no matter what it would take. In the fall of 1941, the German troops seized Kiev. The Nazis also acknowledged the strategic importance of this city. They understood that the loss of Kiev would open the road to the west and their further expulsion from Ukraine. Therefore, being afraid of losing Kiev during the counteroffensive of the Soviet troops, the Germans began building up an impregnable line of defense. Indeed, the shores of the Dnipro River were buried in concrete. Hitler boasted on a number of occasions that he had turned Kiev into a powerful fortress. Hitler's strategic goal was to gain a foothold on the east wall. German propaganda spoke of the creation of an impregnable fortress, the East Wall or Ostwall in German. This was more of a propaganda move. The Germans did not prepare this line of defense from an engineering, operational and tactical point of view. Although the Dnipro River was a serious natural obstacle for the troops' offensive and the Germans were preparing to gain a foothold on this line of defense to stabilize the situation in the war. So the one who owned the city had strategic advantages. Therefore, during the defense and liberation of Kiev, there were brutal and exhausting battles in which the parties spared neither human resources nor hardware. In the summer of 1941, the Germans reached Kiev very quickly. Already on July 11, on the 20th day of the German-Soviet War, the tank units of General von Kleist reached the banks of the river Irpin, 15 kilometers west of the capital of Ukraine. This day is considered the beginning of the Kiev strategic defensive operation of the Red Army against Wehrmacht troops, which lasted 70 days. The German troops were opposed by the forces of the Kiev Special Military District, which, with the start of the war, was reorganized into the Southwestern Front. Soviet troops were superior both in terms of numbers and military hardware. However, the German military units were more experienced than the Soviet troops. For this reason, they managed to skillfully bypass and surround the Soviet forces. The fact of the matter is that the Soviet army lacked both practice and alert commanders. Back in those times, not all the officers had a wristwatch, and not all of them had a map to orient themselves. That is, people, ordinary soldiers who were surrounded, did not know where they were located. They were oblivious as to where the Germans were and where they should retreat. Even if a person knew what kind of village this was, they could not imagine where exactly they really were. This was a clear indication of the low level of training of the rank and file officer personnel. Soviet generals, fearing the anger of Stalin, who forbade surrendering the capital of Ukraine, did not report that the troops of the Southwestern Front were being encircled. The Military Council of Front was ready to leave Kyiv in order to retreat from the encirclement. However, Stalin was adamant. On September 11th, he called Colonel General Mikhailo Kirponos, the commander of the Southwestern Front, and ordered to hold the city at all costs. And after four days, the Germans completely surrounded the Kiev grouping, and only on the night of September 17 to 18, Moscow gave the green light to Kirponov to retreat with his troops. But time was lost. The troops, in anticipation of the order from the high command to retreat, were totally demoralized, and the headquarters had lost the ability to control their movements. During the defense of Kyiv, hundreds of thousands of soldiers were surrounded, and only very few of them managed to escape from this cauldron. Of 400 to 500,000, only 21,000 military men pulled out from Kyiv. This begs the question, could such a large number of soldiers with arms and ammunition in their hands not fight back against the enemy? This period on guard, the absence of an order to retreat, the fear and panic, I believe this was the main reason that so many people were captured. When I studied the latest documents from the archives that were opened and the recollections of eyewitness, I indeed came to the conclusion that the panic, the fear factor, the reluctance to fight back, 
the lack of faith in an escape and the organization of a breakthrough altogether played a major role. These factors were critically important not so much for the rank-and-file soldiers as they were for the officers of the high command. First of all, the officers were responsible for organizing a retreat and finding a possible escape of soldiers from the encirclement. While escaping the encirclement, Kirpanos himself was killed. 800 officers and generals of the front were killed or taken prisoner. Why was the commander of the Southwestern Front, Kirpanos, killed? And how did the chief of staff of that front, Bagramian, manage to break out? The group in which Kirpanos was could not follow the mobile team of Bagramian, as the German troops had immediately closed in. So they decided to try and escape in different direction to the north, but they were unable to break through. German troops entered Kyiv. Leaving the city, the Soviet troops blew up all four bridges, which at that time were an escape route out of Kyiv for the refugees. When retreating, the military disabled the city's power station and water supply. They also threw into the Dnipro River thousands of sacks of food. The victory of the German troops near Kyiv opened their way to the east of Ukraine, to the Donbass and the Azov Sea. From the other side, the diversion of Germany's considerable forces from the central direction to the south enabled the Soviet leadership to prepare for Moscow's defense. During the occupation, tens of thousands of people were taken from Kyiv to work in Germany. 100,000 were shot by the Germans in Babi Yar. The city was badly devastated. The liberation of Kyiv was as bloody and tragic as its defense. Fulfilling Stalin's order to siege the city up to the next anniversary of the October Revolution, the Soviet command did not spare the lives of hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Stalin's generals planned instant crossing of the Dnipro. For this purpose, the Voronezh Front troops covered hundreds of kilometers a day. On the morning of September 22, 1943, parts of the Soviet army reached the Dnipro. Rear services, ammunition, logistical services, the kitchen lagged behind. The command took the decision to force the Dnipro without pontoons, despite the powerful enemy shelling. Dovzhenko once wrote that it was absolutely horrible. The Dnipro waters were covered with blood. Official data, Russian data and Soviet data indicate that troops crossing the Dnipro suffered the greatest losses in the years of the German-Soviet War and World War II in general. The official figure is 417,000 people killed during the Battle of the Dnipro. According to other sources, nearly one million people died in this battle. 27,300 people were engaged in the crossing of the Dnipro. They went under the water. They lined the shore of the river and died on the bridgeheads. Troops of the Voronezh Front seized several bridgeheads on the right bank of the Dnipro. Bridgeheads near the villages of Veliki Bukrin and Lutish posed the greatest threats to the German soldier. The Soviets decided to liberate Kiev from the Bukrin bridgehead, which was located 80 kilometers south of the city. In order to expand and reinforce the bridgehead, the Soviets planned the largest operation in the German-Soviet War. Over the night into September 25, 1943, three regiments of paratroopers were sent to the territory controlled by the German troops. They had to strike from the rear. This would make it possible to clear the way to the offensive, but the operation was unsuccessful. Because of poor preparation of flight crews, in connection with the short preparation of the landing, unpreparedness due to the lack of coordination between headquarters and inadequate material support, the paratroopers faced many challenges. Part of the assault forces, after getting the lay of the land in the morning, found that it is not on the right, but on the left bank of the Dnipro, in the location of its troops. Some of the paratroopers fell directly into the Dnipro, 
Another unit of the paratroopers, instead of landing in a safe area on the right bank near Kaniv, ended up at the positions of the German troops and become easy prey for the latter. In September and October of 1943, the main breachheads of the offensive methodically grinded down the reinforcement. The convict soldiers, the regular troops and the newly mobilized Ukrainians from the left bank. They were later popularly called the Black Infantry, because there was no time to equip them and supply them with weapons. So, among other things, the tanks of the 3rd Guards tank army were taken across to the Bukharin bridgehead in single quantities at that time, as there was a severe lack of material resources and because the reinforcements from the left bank Ukraine were pouring in without uniforms, instead wearing black jackets, hence they were called the Black Infantry. Without training, they were hastily reinforcing the troops and battle blood. After the Kursk bulge during the left bank offensive, the Soviets had to postpone the beginning of this operation several times. Bloody fighting lasted until October 15. The offensive operation continued for three days without success. They managed to advance only a few meters to extend the Bukharin bridgehead. Realizing the futility of the offensive from the Bukharin bridgehead, the Supreme High Command General Headquarters sent a directive to the fronts late at night on October 24. It did not say that the direction of the offensive was erroneous, and among other things, it was said that the failure on this bridgehead was due to the fact that the conditions of the terrain were not taken into account in a timely manner. They supposedly prevented the offensive operations of the troops, especially the tank arm. The Soviets ordered the troops to regroup on the Lutish bridgehead. The Rybalko's 3rd Guards Tank Army just crossed the Dnipro in full force by that time. The 3rd Guards Tank Army was to display wooden models instead of tanks, simulate the work of radio stations and kindle bonfires. That is, to create such a disinformation space to trick the enemy into believing that the army is on the Bukharin bridgehead. So the plan was to secretly at night cross back across the Dnipro, make a 200 km kilometer march, cross the Desna, cross the Dnipro a third time in the Lutish Vishhorod area and enter the Lutish bridgehead. Together with the 3rd Guards tank army, a heavy artillery breakthrough corps was to be redeployed there, consisting of three artillery divisions. This was the most powerful armada. On November 3rd, 1943, the main attack force of the 1st Ukrainian Front struck a blow from the Lutish bridgehead at the enemy troops in the north of Kiev. From 8 in the morning, the artillery was shelling the enemy heavily for 40 minutes. It was not artillery preparation that was used, but a form of heavy weapons use called an artillery offensive, which was a special form of artillery use. The thunder of the artillery offensive could be heard from the area of Lutish and Novi Petrivci. The fire completely swept the advanced German forces. The troops rushed to Kiev, and three days later they were in the capital. November 5th, first to force its way through to the center of Kiev, was the tank of a young man from Vyshorod, First Sergeant Nikifor Sholodenko. He was a scout. His vehicle was at the head of the convoy of equipment. Before the war, Sholodenko studied at the Kiev Polytechnic Institute and therefore knew the western part of Kiev like the back of his hand. At one of the crossroads between Shulyavka and Borshahivka, the sergeant was fatally wounded. One of the streets of the capital of Ukraine was named after him. The fighting in the streets of Kyiv continued all night long into November 6, especially in the areas of the current Barshahivka and Suretz. Fascist troops retreated to the southwest. The chronicle of this day is amazing. The whole city was in ruins and fire. The central street, Rishatik, was basically totally destroyed. Hitler. Hitler, struck by the catastrophe of the German troops near Kiev, ordered Manstein to restore positions on the Dnipro at all and any cost and organize a counteroffensive by the German troops. Hitler's troops tried to neutralize the breakthrough, pulling large forces towards Kiev, mainly tank forces. These units were transferred from France, the Bukharin bridgehead and from Kremenchu. However, the troops of the 1st Ukrainian Front continued a powerful offensive and pursued the enemy in various directions. Korostan, Chitomir, Fostet and Bilatsark. More than 70 years ago, the greatest large-scale military operations of the battle for Kiev were completed. The human losses in the battle 
battles for the city were unjustifiably large, and therefore this issue still requires the careful work of researchers. Search teams still find the graves of soldiers at the sites of fighting for the capital of Ukraine. Soviet propaganda kept silence about the failures of its troops near Kiev. After all, it's taboo to talk about the defeats of the winner. Fierce battles for the Ukrainian capital were remembered only 20 years later, in the summer of 1961, by the decree of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR, a medal for the defense of Kyiv was established. Clearly, the majority of participants of the battles for Kyiv did not receive it.